Greetings, imagination connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, Robert Meyer Burnett. I invite you to watch and listen to the Designing Hollywood podcast, brought to you by Martika Abera and the great, legendary Hollywood costume designer, Marilyn Vance. I am afforded the wonderful opportunity of co-hosting the show. If you are interested in the magic of Hollywood, the design of Hollywood, the clothes of Hollywood, watch the Designing Hollywood podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts from, or find the video version on the John Campia YouTube channel. That's right, the Designing Hollywood podcast. Why would you ever want to miss it, especially if you love the movies? Observations with Robert Meyer Burnett. I've heard it said before, like, it was a very smart man named uh, Robert Meyer Burnett who said, the currency of our current age is authenticity. And it's so true. Imagination Connoisseurs Unlimited in association with Road to Perdition writer Max Allen Collins presents the upcoming audio drama True Noir, the Nathan Heller Casebooks, starring Captain Liam Shaw himself, Picard Season 3's Todd Stashwick in the title role of Nathan Heller, beginning as a Chicago PD officer and becoming Private Eye to the Stars. Look for the crowdfunding campaign for the first eight-hour series coming soon to you. Greetings, Imagination Connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your Master of Fun and Wonder, your Viceroy of Verisimilitude, your Sommelier of Sci-Fi and Cinema, your Evangelist of the Imagination and the As Yet Undefined, maybe never to be defined, although many people have tried, Existential Mr. Rogers, that's right, me. Robert Myburnett and I am once again robcasting at you, you imagination connoisseurs, you members of this, the post geek singularity community. This is Rob Observations, episode 918, in our inexorable march toward that 1,000 minute, 1,000th show. So uh, that's pretty exciting. You know, it's been a long time since I've been able to bitch about Star Trek. And, uh, Boy, gosh, you know, God giveth, God taketh away, and God giveth back. But first, I want to start out with a letter. This letter comes to us from Terrell Williams. Terrell Williams writes in, A Quentin Tarantino Star Trek movie? Bring it. Terrell wrote this to me on Christmas Day. On behalf of my crew and starship, the USS Malcolm X, congratulations on your 914th episode. I have the perfect place for you to celebrate this incredible milestone, the Moss Eisley Cantina. Trust me, they have the absolute best Romulan ale and Klingon dragon blood cake ever. Just remember to keep your phaser set to kill while visiting, for the cantina is full of rowdy scum and villainy, along with a few angry Imperial stormtroopers who love asking for identification. So aim your phaser and don't miss. I need help solving a mystery. In the mirror universe, when the ISS Enterprise encounters the Botany Bay drifting in space, are Khan and his people bad or good? Would Khan and evil Mirror Kirk become allies? My co-workers and I were discussing this topic, and unfortunately, we didn't have any concrete resolutions, only speculations. If there's anyone on Earth who can answer this, it's you, Rob. And speaking of Khan, have you purchased the new hardcover book, Wrath of Khan, Making of the Classic Film, by authors John Tenuto and Maria Jose Tenuto? I have. Some cool behind-the-scenes stuff. And yes, a Quentin Tarantino Star Trek film would be totally wickedly cool. Or good. I would love to see his uncanny interpretation of the original series, Kirk's Five-Year Mission. Come on, Mr. Tarantino, get this Trek cinematic masterpiece made. Well, thanks, Rob, for reading my letter. Looking forward to your future Rob Observations videos. Keep them coming and keep up the awesome work. Captain Terrell Williams. Well, Captain Terrell, listen, I hope nobody sticks anything in your ear. And uh, if somebody does, please don't turn the phaser on yourself. We need you. 
Uh, it's interesting. I have read much speculation over the years, first in the best of Trek anthologies, the paperbacks that were starting to get published in the late 70s, that were basically essays on Star Trek, speculations and examinations of the characters and the situations. And I remember, I remember there was speculation that I actually really enjoyed, that the schism that created the mirror universe uh, was actually Khan's victory that Khan never left Earth, and uh, his civilization continued on. The technology developed much the same as it did in the Prime Trek universe, but Khan's victory led a different, created the Empire. And I always thought, I was kind of like that. So I don't know in the Mirror Universe if every situation is duplicated or not, but in my head canon, maybe that's how the Mirror Universe began. Um, listen, I think, to me... The definitive version of the Mirror Universe, aside from Jerome Bixby's script for Mirror Mirror and the original second season episode, which is one of my favorite episodes of the original series, is Star Trek author David Mack's duology. If you're a Mirror Universe fan, I cannot recommend enough that you read his two books, Sorrows of Empire and Rise Like Lions. And when you read them, what will strike you is, why can't anyone write Star Trek episodes as good as these two books? I don't know. I feel that way about a lot of Star Trek novels, and not a lot of Star Trek novels would I consider great. But let me tell you, many of them are a lot better than the swill that we've been getting as episodic Star Trek for, well, since 2017. I know I'm being a little harsh, because there's a lot of people that like modern Star Trek, because they see themselves reflected back at them. Because that's what everybody should look for in drama. Oh, I'm represented. But anyway... You know, Star Trek used to do all kinds of representation and not draw attention to it. They slyly stuck it in because uh, if they made, if they drew attention to it, maybe net network standards and practices would have paid attention. And people would have said, mm, you know what, maybe Lieutenant Uhura shouldn't be part of the command crew. But you know what, Roddenberry did it anyway. Anyway, that's, I'm not, I don't want to digress. But um, so there was, Quentin Tarantino had an idea for a Star Trek movie. I heard it was maybe a riff on a piece of the action uh, when the Enterprise crew when they ran across Sigma Iosha that was first, well, it was infected by the Horizon visit when the USS Horizon left a book, Chicago Mobs of the 20s behind, and the Sigma Iotians are a very imitative people, uh, and they decided to pattern their whole civilization around one book, and that was one of the things that led to the founding of the Prime Directive in the Star Trek universe. Um, but he was not ever going to direct it. He was going to produce it, and the he wasn't even writing the script. It was his idea. And I forget the name of the writer, but the writer of The Revenant, quite a good writer, uh, was going to write that script, and they didn't know who was going to direct it. I'll tell you, and they should, I'll tell you, if, if, if in, a, in my, my dream world that Tarantino's, the, the funny thing about Tarantino is I don't think that he would make a Star Trek movie. He says he's going to make 10 films and then hang it up. I don't know if that's true. He'll probably get the bug again, but let's just assume he is. His, he's an auteur. While he's borrowed and been inspired by many other films, his movies are unique to him. I can't imagine him taking on a franchise IP and go out. I mean, he might be going out with a bang, but I can't believe he would even do that. However, if this writer were to come up with a great script under his careful, watchful eye, I'll tell you who I think in a perfect world, I would get Edgar Wright to direct it. I first came across people like Edgar Wright and Simon Pegg after I'd made Free Enterprise and I found their series spaced. And I was like, I wish I grew up and knew those people. But um, that's what I would do. I'd get Edgar Wright to direct the script and Tarantino would produce. I think I think it would be, it would be phenomenal. But um, listen, Captain Terrell, thanks for writing in. And I appreciate... Um, the letters. And by the way, if you would like to write me a letter, postgeeksingularity.com, send me a letter. Uh, or you can send a, use a super chat feature and tip feature, and we'll talk about it right now. But um, letters are free. So now, I'm going to tell you a story uh, before we start. So as many of you know, for three years, between 2012, 2013, and 2014, I worked with Roger Lay Jr. and his company, Urban Archipelago Films, and we created 
uh, documentaries for the Blu-ray releases of Star Trek The Next Generation and Star Trek Enterprise. We did the seven seasons of Next Generation. Then we did five single discs. They cut two-part episodes together as movie versions. So people didn't have to buy all the seasons. You could get a movie version. And uh, we did special features, additional special features, audio commentaries, deleted scenes. And I did 30-minute documentary features on those discs as well. So for Next Generation... We did a total of 12 discs, and for Enterprise, we did the four seasons. And so for three years, I was immersed creating um, documentaries about Star Trek. And at the time, other than the bad robot feature films that were covered by feature film production over Paramount, we were the only people creating brand new Star Trek content. So we had, we had two lawyers that were working basically exclusively for us. So everything that we did, because we spent hundreds of hours doing documentaries, uh, documentary interviews with people. We interviewed the whole cast. We interviewed much of the principal behind the scenes crew that made Next Generation and Enterprise possible. We did roundtable discussions with the cast of both shows. It was a lot of work. Very proud of it. Uh, the Next Generation sets won two uh, Saturn Awards. And what was really fun for the first three seasons, we had theatrical events where my documentaries actually played theatrically. I did cut down versions. And I, was, I also created all the blooper reels that you see all over the internet now. So that was a lot of fun working on those. Well, one of the things that we did for the second season was I hosted, I was the on-camera host for a roundtable discussion with the entire principal crew of Next Gen. Um, everybody, you know, Patrick Stewart, Gates McFadden, Marina Sirtis, Jonathan Frakes, LeVar Burton, Brent Spiner, Michael Dorn. Um, and it was, you know, it was, it was everybody. And it was a real honor. And I moderated the conversation. You can see the roundtable. I put some clips up on it on uh, as reels and things on, on YouTube and Instagram. But what was very interesting was I also edited my own stuff. So I, we shot the, this roundtable conversation like it was a network special. And it looks really good. We did it. Uh, they had a 25th anniversary celebration up in Calgary. So we flew up into Calgary in Canada and... I had suggested since they were all going to be there, why not go there since they were there anyway? So I cut it all together. The end of that conversation ended with me asking the crew, or I, I don't know if I asked the crew or somebody brought it up. Well, what would it be like if we had, we had seen in 2012, we'd seen Star Trek 09, we'd seen the reboot of the original series cast with J.J. Abrams and Bad Robot's first Star Trek movie, and then we had Into Darkness. And the question arose, what, what, what might a next generation revival look like? This is before Picard seasons one, two, and three, or Picard season three, where Terry Metallus and crew brought back all the original crew of next generation. And Patrick Stewart made the joke that he already knew what it was like because he saw James McAvoy take over the role of Professor X in the X-Men movies. And they were all riffing on what it would be like. And it was, of course, delightful. So when I cut this all together... I sent it into Paramount. Uh, actually, it was CBS for approval. The lawyers had to vet it to make sure nothing was said that would be objectionable. And really, the only note that I got back was you have to cut out every reference to J.J. Abrams' Star Trek movies. And I was like, why? I mean, we're making documentaries where actors, real actors, are talking about their lives and their thoughts. And it turned out, that you, we could not conflate, we couldn't have any mention anywhere of J.J. Abrams' Bad Robot Star Trek movies. And at the time, there were only two. Now, that was, there's been a lot of uh, uh, shows like Midnight's Edge and, and Doomcock and many other YouTubers have reported on the fact that the J.J. Abrams, the contract that Bad Robot had for the Star Trek movies, things had to be 25% different or... I never had actual official confirmation of that from my perspective. All I can tell you is that my lawyers, our lawyers that were working on, that were vetting all of our material said we could not mention anything about the Kelvin verse J.J. Abrams movies, which I thought was interesting and kind of annoying. Um, and I understand the rights, the bifurcation, because at the time, the rights to Star Trek were owned by CBS. And they to make movies, those rights had to be licensed to Paramount in order for them to make the film. 
and Bad Robot had that license to make those movies. Now, um, I'm editorializing here. I think Bad Robot was a bad steward of the Star Trek franchise. Why do I say that? Because when Bad Robot took over the Star Trek franchise, they saw it as a money-making opportunity, and who wouldn't? It's a big franchise. They figured, as Paramount wanted them to, to update it, make it more like Star Wars, make it more palatable to modern audiences, and rather than make it a, a, a science fiction show, the original Star Trek was basically a science fiction anthology. And you could delve into all different kinds of stories. You could do a Ferengi story one week. You could do a serious story about war or PTSD or losing a limb in another week. Uh, you could talk about, you could find a genderless society and one of those people feels either more masculine and feminine and falls in love with our crew, which was an episode called The Outcast, which was extraordinary. Um, so there were many ways you could deal with things philosophically, allegorically, and Star Trek took into inspiration from all different, like Star Wars before it, uh, or Star Wars after it, from different places. Sometimes you'd have something like Run Silent, Run Deep with Balance of Terror, which is a submarine movie, or you could be inspired by something else, just like Star Wars was inspired by Kurosawa or the Dam Busters or something like that, which modern Star Trek could uh, learn a lot from if they understood they can look outside of Star Trek and take inspiration from, oh, I don't know, science fiction novels. Oh, wait, they did that. They just ripped off Ursula K. Le Guin. Oh, but I digress. So anyway, um, the, the, uh, uh, so Star Trek being an anthology show and an allegorical show, when Bad Robot took it over, their thought was that they were going to turn it into another franchise. Paramount had Transformers. You know, those were, those were clocking a billion dollar box offices. At, but the, they were looking at billion dollar box office. And that's what Paramount had hoped Star Trek could be. That hope was misplaced. And here's the thing. Star Trek is not like Star Wars. It's also not like a regular franchise property. Star Trek has, it's more of a niche audience. It's not necessarily a four quadrant thing. I mean, even though it appealed to me, I was five years old when I started watching it. Star Trek was more of an intellectual exercise, and, and I had to suffer through J.J. Abrams. Every one of his interviews for Star Trek 09, he had to point out, I never liked Star Trek when I was growing up. It was too intellectual for me. Yeah, we could tell. <laughs> but anyway, so here was the problem. Star Trek, when it was, aside from Star Trek The Motion Picture, where they rolled in all the development costs for the unmade Star Treks in the 70s, the movie didn't really cost $44 million. They had a lot of things they had to roll into that budget. But when they had Harv Bennett take over the franchise, they brought Harv Bennett in from Paramount Television to keep the costs down for their Star Trek movies. They were able to make Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, $11 million bucks, And it was essentially made by their TV division. And at the time, it was very profitable. It made almost $80 million. Um, I know it doesn't seem like much now, but back in 1982, it was. A Star Trek movie should not cost $175 million. And what they were doing, rather than the, the uh, advancing the franchise, they decided to go back and do, I, I mean, what's the most brain-dead thing you could do? Oh, let's go back and retell the story of Kirk, Spock, and McCoy and tell a story about them that we don't know. Them first meeting at the Academy, which had been done to, to death in books, but whatever. So they went back and they did this, but $175 million, even if you go by conventional wisdom, that's without marketing, $175 million budget. It means before you, the conventional wisdom is a, a box office success in Hollywood is three to four times more than the movie cost. Because remember, the studios only get 50% of the box office. Sometimes more, sometimes less. But let's just, uh, for in general, it's 50%. So Star Trek 09 did not break half a billion dollars. So with $175 million spend plus marketing, the studio did not make money on that movie. Star Trek Into Darkness was even more expensive. And Star Trek Beyond was not as expensive as Star Trek Into Darkness, but it made far less money. So the three J.J. Abrams bad robot, oh, I know Justin Lin directed Star Trek Beyond, but the, the three bad robot Star Trek movies were way too expensive and they never earned out. And that's why a Star Trek IV that's had 
I mean, how many directors now have been announced to do Star Trek Four? Five, maybe? The writing teams, the reason they haven't been able to make it is because they haven't been able to make the money work. And when you have the cast coming back for a fourth movie, they all want, you know, a lot of cheddar. The problem is, with that cast, they can't make money. You want to make money with a Star Trek movie? You make it for $100 million. And here's the thing. Anybody that knows their Star Trek knows that you can make great Star Trek with two actors in a room. And if you don't believe me, take a look at second seasons, uh, actually the, 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 um, the second part of the sixth season Next Generation episode, Chain of Command Part 2. You basically have David Warner as Gold Madrid and Patrick Stewart, who's sitting in a chair most of the time, two actors going at it, riveting Star Trek. Uh, the end of Deep Space Nine's first season, the penultimate episode, Duet, is another story that is very pertinent today. Basically, it's a chamber chamber drama with, again, with Nana Visitor and one other actor. You don't need to spend a ton of money to make an effective Star Trek movie. What you do need are what you always need. Great stories and great characters. And with Star Trek, you take a page from the original series you use spe special effects sparingly. And some of the best Star Trek episodes were what were called bottle shows. Uh, in order to keep the costs down, what they would do is they would shoot the episodes on their standing sets. They wouldn't go on location. They wouldn't build new visual effects. They wouldn't make new models or whatever. I mean, sometimes they would. But for the most part, they'd figure out innovative ways to shoot on their standing sets. Like, for instance the Enterprise might encounter another starship, another Constitution-class starship, which means you just redress your sets. And in the case of the second season TOS episode Doomsday Machine, you find the constellation wrecked by a robotic planet-devouring machine, and uh, suddenly you've got the makings of one of the most banger episodes of Trek ever, and it's a bottle episode. You're shooting on your standing sets. Everything is a redress. So you get to stay in your in, in, on the sound stages. You're not going outside anywhere. And by the way, in the original version of that, they went and literally bought an AMT model kit from the store to stand in for the Constellation. <laughs> literally. That's what they did. They went and bought an off-the-shelf model kit, AMT model kit, keeping those prices down. That's part of what Star Trek is. And, and nowadays, they haven't been able to get Star Trek IV off the ground because it's just too damn expensive to make. In my mind, if you can't make a Star Trek feature film for $100 million or less, you don't know what you're doing. And um, yeah, it's easy for me to say, right? Because I don't have to keep those costs down. But anyway, so here, we're, here we are. Uh, they haven't made a Star Trek movie since Star Trek Beyond, but they keep wanting to because Star Trek is a known IP. Now... Obviously, we've had Star Trek on television since 2017. We've had Star Trek Discovery, which is a prequel. We've had Star Trek Strange New Worlds, which is a prequel. Star Trek 09, the J.J. Abrams Star Trek 09, was both, well, it was, it was a prequel and it was an alternative universe story. So we've had three prequels to Star Trek. And... What's interesting is, and if you want to include Enterprise, the series Enterprise, the last Berman Roddenberry era Star Trek show that aired from 2001 to 2005, that was a prequel as well that was leading up to the birth of the Federation. Now, interestingly enough, uh, here's something that's not talked a lot about in terms of Star Trek history. After Enterprise went off the air, Paramount was run by Donald DeLine and Carrie McCluggage. And these two... Uh, studio executives, they tapped writer Eric Jedrinson to write a Star Trek feature film. He was actually, the idea was to make a Star Trek trilogy of films. Now, Eric Jedrinson wrote, um, he was the supervising producer of HBO's Band of Brothers. Most recently, you might know Eric Jedrinson for co-writing the script for Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1 with Chris McQuarrie. Eric Jedrinson, like Nicholas Meyer before him, was not familiar with Star Trek. Hey, he really, he, he didn't watch Star Trek. So what he did was he took a deep dive into Trek. And as a smart, educated guy, he really understood what made Star Trek tick. And he wrote a script called what they were tentatively calling Star Trek The Beginning. 
And in Jedrinson's mind, this was going to be the Odyssey. Uh, and then he wanted to write the second part was going to be the Iliad in his own mind. And then they didn't know what the third part was going to be. But it really dealt with the early days of Starfleet Academy. As a matter of fact, I really like this script. It was only a first draft script. But for a first draft, it's I thought it was a terrific script. And um, it, 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 I, I really loved it. And what it had to do with was the outbreak of the Romulan War. And it dealt with ethnic cleansing. It was very allegorical. And the Romulans wanted Earth to basically... The Romulans were going after the Vulcans. And they were threatening Earth. And they said, look you better expel all the Vulcans off your planet or we will destroy your world. And it, Earth said, basically, fuck you. And it went from there. There's a lot going on, but it would have been a, a fertile ground to have cameos from people uh, that were on the Enterprise show. You could have brought back Captain Archer. You could have cast somebody like Tom Hanks as a Starfleet Admiral. Uh, it, it, it could have been great. And it ended on a cliffhanger and it would have made, I thought, a really great series. Uh, of films could have made a great trilogy. Nothing happened with it because Donald's line and Carrie McCluggage, their reign at Paramount was very short lived. There was a new, new regime that came in and that project died on the vine, never to be made, but they still own it. Uh, but it would have been a great bridger between enterprise and then the beginnings of the original series. Um, unfortunately it never happened. So, Hey, Today, this afternoon, um, this afternoon, this was announced in the Hollywood Reporter at 3.33. You know, 3.33 is half of 666. Just want to point that out. I don't know what that means. But Aaron uh, uh, Couch wrote this article. <sighs> New Star Trek movie in the works at Paramount from Andor Director. The film will take place decades before J.J. Abrams' 2009 feature. Let me just read this article and we're going to unpack this. So after years of stops and starts, Paramount is making a step toward returning Star Trek to the big screen. Toby Haynes, who directed episodes of the Star Trek series Andor, will helm a new feature with Seth Graham Smith writing. The plot is said to take place decades before the events of 2009 Star Trek, which J.J. Abrams helmed. Abrams' Bad Robot will produce the movie, which the studio is describing as an expansion of its Trek universe. Trek has largely lived in the world of TV and streaming in recent years, with Paramount Plus home to a number of shows, including Strange New Worlds, Discovery, The Animated Lower Decks, and Picard, which wrapped last year. Star Trek Beyond, the most recent Trek film, hit theaters in 2016 and starred Chris Pine as Captain Kirk, the role he first played in 2009 Star Trek. Zachary Quinto, Simon Pegg, Carl Urban, Zoe Saldana, John Cho, and the late Anton Yelchin also starred. Paramount is still developing a fourth Star Trek feature that uh, to feature that cast and described it as the final chapter for this crew. Paramount has spent years figuring out a new big screen take for Star Trek After Beyond. Yeah, they've they've announced more Star Trek 4s than Kathleen Kennedy has announced Star Wars movies. Um, Beyond was soft at the box office. In 2016, the studio announced a Star Trek 4 to star Chris Hemsworth, who played Kirk's father in the 2009 film. Alongside Pine's Enterprise crew, that film never came to fruition. And filmmakers such as Quentin Tarantino and Noah Hawley took stabs at developing their own unrelated takes. During a Paramount Investors Day in February 2022, producer Abrams made the surprise announcement a new installment was in the works with the Pine-led crew and would be shooting by the end of the year, a move that took even the cast by surprise. WandaVision's Matt Shackman was on board to direct, but departed in August 2022 to take on Fantastic Four for Marvel Studios. Smith, known as the author of Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter and the scribe behind features such as the Lego Batman movie, and in my mind, a perfect guy to write a Star Trek film. Oh, wait. Uh, this would mark the first feature for Haynes, who helmed the dark, celebrated Star Trek-inspired episode of Black Mirror, the USS Callister. He's repped by William Morris and attorney Peter Nelson. So, here's what's interesting about what they just announced. They said that it was going to take place decades before Star Trek 09. Well, what's interesting about Star Trek 09, J.J. Abrams' own Star Trek 09, is it spans 
a 25-year period of time. Now, what's interesting about J.J. Abrams' Star Trek 09, they made, I think, a bold choice to be unfettered and unconstrained by the many years of Star Trek continuity, they decided to set their Star Trek movie in an alternate universe. So, at the beginning of the movie, presumably, uh, the movies are called the Kelvin-verse movies because the movie opens with the USS Kelvin in command of Captain Rabot, and the second in command is George Kirk, Kirk's father. And um, in this movie... Uh, in this in this opening, what happens is a ship from the next generation era with Borg technology, the Narada, captained by the Romulan Nero, comes back in time from almost a hundred years in the future, and that the, they call it the Narada incursion. And what happened was that was a schism in the space time continuum when the Kelvins destroyed and George Kirk was killed. It changed the universe. So the universe skewed off into a different direction than our start than our Star Trek universe went in, and so everything after that was not canon to the original series. It was the in the Kelvin verse, which was an interesting choice. But at the beginning of that movie, you still see the Kelvin and the Kelvin itself, presumably, and I had to accept this myself. The Kelvin is canonical to the original. Star Trek universe. However, unlike, say, Star Wars, when they're making a prequel and they make everything look exactly the same the way it's supposed to look, since 2009 and in Discovery and in Strange New Worlds, there is absolutely no fealty to the original series. They just change things willy-nilly. Well, we have to give it a visual updating. And Why do you have to do that? In Deep Space Nine, for the 30th anniversary of Star Trek, they actually have the crew, the Deep Space Nine principles, go back in time and they in a beautiful episode trials and tribulations they go back in time and they actually inserted the characters into original footage from the original series and our characters interact Bashir and O'Brien actually interact it's it's brilliantly done with Shatner's Kirk and that that was that was the original you know the original series this odd idea that they have to change everything. All the people that came in, uh, I have a theory about this. See, and this is what's driven me berserk. The Star Trek universe demands to be taken seriously. Part of being a fan of Star Trek from 1966 through 2005 was there was a concerted effort made by everybody who worked on the show on every level to sort of make it of a piece. When they were making Next Generation, they jumped almost 100 years into the future so everything old could be new again. They could design things. But even when they did designs, they used corridors from that they'd made for Star Trek The Motion Picture. They'd use them in the bridge or in the uh, designs and the sets of the Enterprise D. So there was a lineage, a design lineage. You could see it. Now, while I understand the sets for the original series and the way they were lit um, are very different than what we're used to in modern Star Trek. But you could keep those sets exactly the same way, add more detail to them, and light them in a modern fashion and shoot them in a wider aspect ratio. I know because I've done it. I've shot things on a replica of the bridge, the, the official Star Trek set tour. I've shot a short on those sets, and you can make it look modern. And... Um, it's just a question of lighting and detail. But they decided not to do that. Deep Space Nine proved you could go back in time 30 years and the design work works just fine. But everybody who's taken over Star Trek since 2009, J.J. Abrams being the first, who didn't like Star Trek very much anyway, there's been a concerted effort to try and turn Star Trek into something else, into a different kind of a franchise. They want to make it like this or like that to appeal to different kinds of people. Star Trek has always been niche, but it's proven that you can take that niche and you can make it populist. They did it with Star Trek The Voyage Home in 1986. Yes, the one with the whales. Great Star Trek story, humorous, time travel was involved, but it had a really interesting 
ecological message. And it made sense. It was very accessible to everybody. If you had never seen Star Trek before, you could watch that movie and be entertained by it. That's clever writing. And you had Leonard Nimoy and Nicholas Meyer coming back to work up that script, come up with the story, and, and, and make it the, as good as it was. This idea now, everybody wants to change Star Trek and turn it into something else. It's never been entirely successful. You look at a movie like Rogue One. I mean, they, they bend over backwards to make everything look... Star Trek came out, it ended in 1969. It ended only eight years before Star Wars came out. And yet, the designs of Star Wars have endured. Nobody would ever think of changing the Millennium Falcon. And also... I mean, if you look at Star Trek The Motion Picture and the refit of the Enterprise, uh, it's still one of the most glorious fictional spaceships ever. And in terms of rebooting something and updating its design, elegant, it, the, the people that designed it knew exactly how it worked, and compare that to the redesign of the Enterprise in J.J. Abrams' Star Trek 09. Yeesh. Now, I understand that, but um, as a franchise, the people... Now, Alex Kurtzman has said Star Trek is a delivery system for whatever message he wants to convey that he thinks is important enough to, I don't know, convey to people. I don't know why Star Trek, I mean, it was always a very progressive show that had messaging, but they were it was built into the stories. So once again, while the writer, and I, I don't know why he, I, I mean, he's written parodies of things, but... He's never written anything that I would say, oh, he's going to write a Star Trek movie and it's going to be great. The director who did the USS Callister, I like that episode of Black Mirror, but it was uh, also a parody. And the thing is, as I've said before on this show a lot, my problem with Star Trek is everybody who's worked on Star Trek since 2009, none of them take it seriously. None of them. They don't take the universe seriously. They look at the original series as camp because it's very hard to go back, and I get it. It's like, it's like old Doctor Who. But you know what? When Doctor Who came back, even with Paul McGann, with the Fox TV movie, and then they brought back with Christopher Eccleston, um, they brought back Doctor Who, was he the ninth Doctor? And then they went from there. There was a concerted effort to update Doctor Who, but nobody said, well, we can't use a police call box anymore because there aren't very many police call boxes left in London. They kept the police call box. They kept the TARDIS the way it was supposed to be. And while I think modern Doctor Who is sort of, I mean, Russell T. Davies has come back and done it, you know, um, I don't know if it's going to re reach the heights of the David Tennant, Matt Smith, Christopher Eccleston era, because I think it's never... Uh, quite reach those heights. But the same thing is true. This this weird compulsion to use modern messaging and jam it into our venerable franchises doesn't make much sense to me. What I want in Star Trek is I want to see great science fiction that's allegorical, that has something to do with our world today. Um, instead, it's all kind of a goof. Uh, people love Strange New Worlds, and I understand that, but people like Strange New Worlds. I have a theory about this, too. They like Strange New Worlds because it's their sense memory, their pop culture memory of what Star Trek is supposed to be. Star Trek Strange New Worlds, to me, I like the actors. It has no credibility. It doesn't do, it does not build a universe that I believe in. The whole show is wink, wink, nudge, nudge. All of it, even when it gets as serious as, as it tries to get. They do not build, to me, a credible universe that I can believe in. Whereas you watch Deep Space Nine or Voyager, whether you like those shows or not, they, they credibly fit in with Next Generation. You could believe all three of those shows were of a piece. Enterprise is less successful at that because the producers, Rick Berman and Brandon Braga, who created that show, were limited. They had a lot more network interference than Next Gen, Deep Space Nine, and Voyager had. They wanted to spend uh, the first season of Enterprise on Earth and deal with the political ramifications of the Vulcan involvement with human affairs, which I thought would be a great idea. And they would launch the Enterprise, the NX-01, at the end of that first season, which would have been a great thing to do. Unfortunately, they weren't able to do it. So my question is, with Paramount, maybe it's on the chopping block, maybe it's not. 
um, once again, our our most beloved franchise properties. Hey, there's going to be a Ray movie. Oh, wait. No, we're going to do The Mandalorian and Grogu. But wait a minute. Haven't we been getting The Mandalorian and Grogu on TV? And wasn't the third season a little, uh, mm, shall we say, not as good as seasons one and two? Why are we getting another Star Wars movie of stuff we've already been getting? Are we supposed to be excited by that? Well, everyone loves Grogu and everyone loves The Mandalorian. You know what people love? Great storytelling. I mean, if you're going to make a Star Wars movie, why not look back at The Empire Strikes Back and the original Star Wars, those two films? Add in Return of the Jedi. I really don't understand. And 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 now, uh, uh, again, modern Star Trek, everyone is outside of Star Trek. I always get the feeling when I'm watching modern Star Trek that everyone's too cool for school. And and they they're they're writing it's one step away from being wink wink nudge nudge you know it's funny when i think about uh, this is a uh, outside example but um i love captain jack harkness i have a man crush on john barrowman i love that guy i think that torchwood children of earth i'd never seen the first two seasons of torchwood i only knew captain jack from doctor who I sat down and I watched Torchwood Children of Earth. And if you haven't seen it, it's only five episodes long. And I had not, other than what I'd seen in Doctor Who, and it was sporadic, I didn't know anything about Torchwood. I didn't know, I hadn't seen the two seasons. That was five hours of the most riveting televised science fiction I've seen in 20 years. And it it, it left my jaw on the floor. And in terms of everything from LGBTQ representation to telling great a great science fiction story to really being compelling, I I put it on. I put the first episode on at one in the morning when I came home from work, and I ended up watching all five. I couldn't stop watching. That was part of the long running Doctor Who series. It was a spin off of Doctor Who, but my God, that kind of science fiction is what I want from Star Trek. Star Trek should be the Tiffany standard of upscale science fiction. I mean, hell. For All Mankind, which is my favorite science fiction show, by the way, the fourth season ends tomorrow, tomorrow night, six o'clock, last episode starts airing on Apple Plus, I know they always say Friday, but it's always the night before it's six o'clock, um, that to me, that show, yes, it's melodrama, of course, but it's aspirational tone is ultimately, and it does representation great. You want to watch a show that has all different kinds of representation in it done properly, For All Mankind is your show. In my head canon, uh, even though they mentioned Star Trek, I want to believe that For All Mankind is the precursor to Star Trek. To me, that's that's the prequel series that, that should exist. And I ask you, if you're going to do a prequel series about Star Trek, what's it going to be about? The founding of the Federation yet again? Why are you making a... First of all, why do you want to make a prequel to Star Trek when you don't even like the original series? The first thing you're going to do is change everything. So what's it to fuck? What is it supposed to be a fucking prequel to? I don't understand. None of these prequels. I mean, Enterprise was the closest because the lineage was there, and but they, they it was still deeply compromised from their original vision. But when they're making a prequel, Star Trek 09, let's go change everything. Let's stick the Enterprise on. Uh, you know, let's let's have it being built like it's at a shipyard, like where the Titanic was made. I mean, the problem is. The thought process behind these things, no one actually says, we're going to make a prequel to Star Trek. They're going to be like, we're going to make the Star Trek I've always wanted to make. We're going to, we're going to change everything I never liked about the original Star Trek. We're going to make it cool. So they're never making a real prequel to it. They're just retelling something and vaguely making it fit kind of with Star Trek. I mean, Star Trek is probably the most well-documented fictional universe ever. You can buy books encyclopedias and chronologies and books and analyzing every last bit of the Star Trek universe. But you know what the most annoying thing about Star Trek is? Modern Star Trek is none of it fits. No one has no one has, has tried really very hard at all to make any of the technology or the costumes or the set design or any of it make any sense. So it's been one prequel after another after another. Star Trek 09 Star Trek Discovery, Strange New Worlds, prequels that really are not prequels because they're not at all set in the same universe. No one's made any effort to do that. Everything has changed. 
Star Trek, let, hey, we've changed the Enterprise. How is the Enterprise, you know, Deep Space Nine, 30 years after the original Star Trek, Greg Jean built a model of the original Enterprise. It looked like the original Enterprise. And when the Strange New Worlds or the Discovery Enterprise doesn't look like the Enterprise, and it's supposed to be, how do you reconcile that? You know, Star Trek is a history of the future, a future that never existed. And there's been no effort to try and continue that within modern Star Trek. So they're going to make a, a... And I want to point something out as well. So if it's a bad robot Star Trek movie... And here's the thing. So the the Kelvin incursion, uh, the Narada, the incursion, took place 25 years before uh, Kirk and Spock meet at Starfleet Academy. So within the span of Star Trek 09, we see about 25 years take place. You're, it's, it's going over 25 years. Well, so this news story says it's a bad robot Star Trek movie. Does it take place... Is it a prequel in the alternate universe, in the Kelvin verse? So, like, once history has been changed, because once the Kelvin comes through, once, I mean, pardon me, once the Kelvin's destroyed and the Narada comes through and history has changed, is history changed all the way back? So, we're going to see a prequel to the Kelvin movies? Or are they going to make a prequel? to the actual prime universe that we saw at the very beginning of Star Trek 09. Or maybe you could make the argument that the whole thing takes place in the alternate universe and even the Kelvin itself is something that we saw. It was already the retroactive change in history after the Narada had come through the time, uh, the black hole. I know it gets a little timey-wimey, but I'd be curious because if in fact... There is legal documents or legal precedent that says, okay, Bad Robot does indeed have to make things 25% different. And the only reason that I have to, that I can, I can honestly say anything about that is because in my personal experience, I had to change work that I had done for the Next Generation Blu-rays, which by the way were recently re-released as part of the Picard Legacy box set. And they had to, I had to change them. I had to take out all references to the... Uh, Kelvin verse. So if that's the case, if Bad Robot is still making a Star Trek movie under their own license, is the prequel they're making still in their own Kelvin universe? Does anyone even think like this at Paramount these days? I don't know. Probably not. <laughs> I would imagine no. <laughs> so, you know, it's 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 a lot of wackiness. But once again, we're getting a prequel. What's with Star Trek? What's with Star Trek? Can you tell me? You could make a great original science fiction story um, that's new, that we haven't seen before. Why does everything have to be a prequel? And it's so interesting because if you're making a prequel, by definition, you're, you're going back to fill in the blanks, which means you're going back and you're trying to uh, uh, retread ground that isn't really yours to deal with when the original creators aren't involved and you're going back and you're showing the first meeting of those creators and then trying to say it's canon there's something kind of icky about that there's something kind of uncreative about that go make something new like i do not understand why akiva goldsman wanted to poach so many original series characters nurse chapel pike uhura kirk sam kirk um why those weren't your characters. Wouldn't you much rather create a whole new cast of characters and make them out of whole cloth and make them yours? I don't know. Maybe not. Um, anyway, I will say this. I am willing, as always, to withhold judgment until I see the work. I always want new Star Trek, no matter who's working on it, to be great. And I'll tell you, while I did love Star Trek The Motion Picture, you know, when it came out, it was a little divisive. And I was apprehensive when Nicholas Meyer took uh, took on Wrath of Khan. But what did we get with Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan? We got somebody who watched Star Trek, who was classically educated, came from a family of artists and musicians, and really knew, understood, went back and read Horatio Hornblower, watched Star Trek and understood the classical nature of the storytelling. 
And he wrote a, a more nautical themed. I mean, you might as well have set Star Trek Two. You could you could have set it on a sailing ship if you wanted to. You could have taken that same story and set it in the 1700s, and you could have made Master and Commander, and it would have been great. But you had somebody that really knew what they were doing, coming off the heels. He was a novelist, but coming off the heels of his wonderful film Time After Time, a great science fiction movie, also very classical in its structure and tale storytelling. Going back with historical figures, H.G. Wells and Jack the Ripper. And if you haven't seen Time After Time, shame on you. It's a wonderful movie, and you should go see it. Why can't we have those kinds of creators working on Star Trek that really understand what they could have with the franchise? I don't know. I don't know. But once again, a prequel. Who's making these decisions? Who thinks these are good ideas? I mean, again, I don't want to be a hater. I want it, I want it to be great. But a prequel? The wonderful thing about Star Trek in terms of the Berman Next Generation era, from 1987 to 2005, Star Trek moved forward. And Enterprise, yes, was a, a prequel series, but they knew they wanted to delve into the founding of the Federation. And while maybe Rick Berman and Brandon Braga were pretty burnt out on Star Trek by the time they got there, there's some respectable stuff going on. And Matty Cotto's fourth season of Enterprise does a really good job delving into Star Trek history and trying to fill in those blanks. But why isn't Star Trek moving forward? Why is it, it seems, I mean, if there's a metaphor to be found in modern Star Trek, and now this is not to say that Mike McMahon's efforts with Star Trek Lower Decks or Star Trek Prodigy, which was going forward, and ironically, I think that Star Trek Prodigy might be my favorite of all the modern Star Trek episodes, or all modern Star Trek shows, but Lower Decks is all a parody and a farce, in addition to, start, it's starting to tell good Star Trek stories, but I still feel it's, it's on the outside, it's still got this comedic bent to it, where I don't feel that Mike McMahon has told us a serious tale, whereas what I want to see is, I want to see The Empire Strikes Back to Star Wars. I want to see that kind of thing. I want to see somebody tackling a real science fiction and make Star Trek feel like it's a real important science fiction show. The Expanse meets the West Wing. Those kinds, that kind of tone. Star Trek is goofy, and I don't believe it anymore. And uh, I don't believe the command structure on ships. I don't believe the way people talk to each other. I don't believe the set design. I don't believe the visual effects. I don't believe any of it. I don't know. That's just me. Um, anyway, therein lies my rant. Let's see what you guys are saying. I know that there's a lot of people <laughs> that are that are chiming in. So uh, let's, uh, let's hear what you all think. Because... Um, you know, people get sick of me. Look, you can send me uh, old man Simpsons memes where I'm shouting at clouds. Look, I admit it. I probably am. But this is a franchise that I grew up with and it made it, it meant so much to me. And I, I feel that I've been watching it vandalized for the last six years, now seven years, by, by people that have taken it and um, are using it. You know, I mean, there's nothing wrong with making money. But great Star Trek would make a lot more money. The problem is we haven't been getting great Star Trek. It's middling at best. And um, if you were able to make great Star Trek, I think you'd really have something. But unfortunately, I don't know. Uh, Garrett Groover says, question. Tarantino making a Star Trek movie is like Martin Scorsese making a Daredevil movie. It immediately gets my attention. Should studios hire more auteurs to direct franchise movies? 100%. 100%. The problem is they're not given total oversight. You know, the once these franchises, now that franchises are franchises, I mean, look, here's the interesting thing about the Star Trek franchise. Nicholas Meyer proved what an auteur could do and what you could get. But then what happened was, and and while God bless Leonard Nimoy, I, I, I'd met him, I'd been to his house, I love Spock, I love the character, but Nimoy as an actor leveraged... Uh, Leverage with the studio, the only way they could make Star Trek 3 was to let him come back and direct. I would much rather have seen an auteur come back and make a Star Trek movie. But instead, then, of course, Nimoy directed the next um, two films. Then, because Nimoy did, Shatner had to. And, you know, God bless them both. But they were not directors. Their first time out should not have been directing giant special effects films. 
what we could have got if they made Star Trek. It was kind of like what I thought the Mission Impossible franchise was for a while. When you allowed, you had Brian De Palma do number one, you had John Woon do number two, you had J.J. Abrams do number three, you had Brad Bird do number four. So they had these different directors putting their imprintur on them, which is really interesting. Then, of course, we have Chris McQuarrie doing the last, and he's been doing a bang-up job. Dead Reckoning, but uh, I really love Rogue Nation, I really love Fallout, and um, that's really interesting. But the problem is, no auteurs want to work on Star Trek. It's very difficult. Same with Star Wars. How do you find people to make those movies, especially now, when really the studio wants a lot of oversight? I mean, look, to be fair, I tried watching Star Trek 09. It just popped up on YouTube. I can't, wa- I, I can't watch that movie. I find that movie almost unwatchable. I, I just, the way it's shot, the set design, everything about that movie drives me absolutely bonkers. Um, I always look for verisimilitude. I'm like, there's none in that movie. <laughs> I mean, you know, you got guys on the Kelvin repelling on ropes. And there's all this open, empty space. I'm like, guys, it's a spaceship. <laughs> anyway. Um, uh, Merrickson says, hi, Rob. In Star Trek, does the technology exist to genetically alter the sex of a person? Um but if so, wouldn't that be illegal in the Federation? Oh, yeah. You could. Here, here's the funny thing about the Star Trek universe. They've never really delved into it. But, yeah, they would have, I mean, in my head canon, I would imagine that um, they have the ability using transporter technology, surgical techniques. I mean, they can, they can uh, do anything they want. You know, you, 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 I don't think you could rebuild somebody all the way down to their DNA, but you could certainly... Throughout Star Trek, people have altered DNA, you know. Um, sure, why not? I mean, whether it's legal or not, I don't I don't necessarily think it would be uh, illegal. I mean, say, for instance, um, like I've always believed that if we have advanced enough medical technology, say you have someone who's trans, for instance, I think eventually we'll be able to tell that someone who's actually trans they're, they do have, uh, their brain chemistry is, is different from the body that they're in. So if you're born a man and you have the brain chemistry of a female, th- we can't recognize that now. But I think in the future, we probably could. Now, if in my Star Trek future, they could easily, you know, when someone's born, they could probably say, okay, well, we can do whatever we need to do and make sure that we, we make sure that the brain chemistry and the body go together. No, no one would be wiser. Nobody would care that because that's that's where we're at. That's what the progressive future of Star Trek would be be like. So nobody would wouldn't bother anyone. And I don't think I don't think that um, it would necessarily. Um, I mean, they might want to, parents might want to wait to consent or whatever, let people grow older, but they would know these things. They would have all the information they would need so they could make those choices. Um, what is against the law in the Federation? is to genetically enhance people either before birth or once they're born, you know, to create. And the reason being is because of what happened during the eugenics wars, all the way back to the late 1990s, when scientists began eugenics programs trying to make better human beings, and they were using science to genetically alter humans to make them better, stronger. And as Spock pointed out, in Space Seed, in the first season of the original series, He said the scientists forgot one thing. Superior ability breeds superior ambition. And one of those byproducts, as Jeff Goldblum says in Jurassic Park, just because you can do a thing doesn't mean you should do a thing. But these scientists, which, you know, why not make people more resilient? It seems like something to do. But when you are now bifurcating the species and making a certain amount of people that are genetically enhanced better than the people, it's the same thing that happened with... um, Mutants in the X-Men, Homo Superior and Homo Sapiens. Magneto's like, we're better than they are, Charles. Why shouldn't we take over? We're the next stage of human evolution. So uh, genetic engineering is illegal in the Federation. So Mad Chad says, Rob, did you see the Fox News host that said she likes Star Trek more because Star Wars is now too woke? <laughs> it's obviously she, it's obvious she never watched Star Trek. P.S. The constant wokeness discourse is exhausting. Yeah, you know what's you know what's really interesting though about that. Um, the idea is if you if you really think about what a possible human future would be, eventually, if we were a spacefaring race that went out to the stars, 
we would have to get our shit together because only only a, a planet uh, that and I'm not saying we have to have a global one world government or something like that but we would all have to live in peace because when we were venturing out all of us would be human beings from earth suddenly there is only one there's different ethnicities but there is only one species of human on this planet we might have different ethnicities and different features because of where we're from because we adapt to the the environments that we live in but when you become a spacefaring race, we're all the same. We're all humans from Earth. And we might come in different shapes, sizes, and colors, but we're still human beings. And um, I think that's what they were postulating in, in, in the Star Trek future, was that is the natural progression of humanity once we became a spacefaring race. And I think like you look at shows like The Expanse, what I loved about The Expanse was how they 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 cast people... A lot of them were people of how, who had mixed ethnic backgrounds, which makes sense because I think as we're able to trans, trans if, if you can jump on a plane and, and supersonically go from Los Angeles to Paris in a couple of hours, a lot of people are going to be hop skipping and jumping around the planet. And as we're meeting more and more people, you're going to see a lot more intermarriages and all of that stigma is going to quickly fade away. Um, so it makes sense that in the future that you know, the, the ethnic and uh, national uh, problems that we might have with one another would melt away. And I think that that was a logical extension of great science fiction. I mean, one of the things I just cannot stand about Star Trek Discovery is Star Trek Discovery has leapt a thousand years in the future. Um, the, the, the future for humanity and indeed the Federation that they've depicted in Star Trek Discovery is one of the most brain-dead, inane futures I can possibly imagine. Jesus Christ, pick up any book. Pick up, read one Peter Peter Hamilton book. Read Werner Vinge's A Fire Upon the Deep. Read anything. Just pick up any science fiction novel set. Read Dune. The, the future that's depicted in Star Trek Discovery is so bad, it's hard to watch. And um, not a lot of foresight there. You know, great writers who are great world builders go, okay, well, what would it be like? How would humanity progress in the next thousand years? I'll tell you how they wouldn't progress the way they're depicted in Star Trek Discovery. Anyway, uh, Tack says, random, but one of my favorite memories with Star Trek 09 is when me and my brother decided to do a drinking game when we took a shot every time there was a lens flare. Needless to say, we were too drunk to finish the movie about eight minutes in. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I'll tell you something. There's so many things about Star Trek 09 that I can't stand, but I'll give you just a small... A small, a, small, a small thing that makes me want to punch the screen. So at the beginning of the movie, we see the Kelvin uh, is flying by a star. And <laughs> Captain Rabau comes onto the bridge of the Kelvin. And on the bridge, the light of the star is blazing onto the bridge. Blazing. And so the entire bridge crew is there under the light of this just star that's blazing into the bridge. And it's not until Captain Rabal gets on the bridge, he says, polarize the view screen. <laughs> and then suddenly the view screen goes, Brrr. it's like putting sunglasses on the view screen. It took the captain to come on the bridge. Like what? The rest of the crew, the people that are can't see under the brightness of the goddamn starlight that's blazing into the bridge. None of them could have said polarize the view screen. And I understand J.J. Abrams wants a cool like thing to show, but none of that made any sense. I'm like, I hate this movie, and we're like five minutes in. Polarize the view screen. <laughs> what? No, no. What if he didn't? What if he was sleeping for eight hours? Did they just have to sit with the brightness of the sun blazing? In? No, I know. People are like, Rob, why do you even care about that? Why do I care about that? Because I'm watching this going, nobody would work under those conditions. The polarization would have happened either automatically or somebody would have said it. You don't need the captain to come on the bridge and go polarize the view screen when you're hanging out by a star. And imagine every minute in Star Trek 09, there's something like that that made me want to scoop my eyeballs out with my fucking teaspoon. Because it showed there was so little thought behind all this. Let's just make it look cool. Yeah, but we have to make it credible. No, no, no. It's, it's going to be cool. We're going to make it look cool. I mean, ugh. God, I hate that movie. I can't stand. And if you ask me, I, I could probably, I, you know, I'm not going to take the time to do it, but I could give you a list of like a hundred things. Rob Burnett's hundred things he hates about Star Trek 09. 
And that's one of them. And that's just one of them. So there was a lot of lens for her. Oh, oh I'm dying, you idiot Sinclair. Uh, have you ever watched any videos from Devin Tracy, a.k.a. Atheism is Unstoppable? Um, I am not sure. I am not sure. Um, I don't think so. Maybe, because I jump around a lot. But, you know, I didn't finish answering Mad Chad about, about um, the wokeness discourse. Remember, I mean... Ultimately, people want to be treated properly. They want they want to feel like they're seen. I have no problem with that. Um, but it, it's it's so interesting. It's it's like what they also want to do is erase all of human history up to this point. You know, let's get rid of the Western canon. Let's get rid of it. You know, we're not going to listen to classical music anymore because it was written by a bunch of old white men. Yes, but it's still good. And until you can replace that canon with something that can endure through hundreds of years that had that kind of creativity behind it. And remember, the world was a certain way back then. And that's all you could get. Now, I'm tired of people wanting to just destroy what came before because they're not replacing it with anything. And um, if you want to dismantle, say, American democracy, the American Republic, for whatever reason, it's built on the backs of whatever... And racists and all that. yeah, human history is terrible. But we're here. Where we're, we're, are you going to dismantle, destroy it all? And and then where are you going to be? Or right, who's going to? What, what are you going to do? What, you, let's let's dismantle all the things you don't like. What are you going to replace it with? I don't know. We're all going to be Marxist. That's never worked out. What are you going to do when you have kids and you want your kids? You want something? You want things for your children to make them better than you are? Marxism is not going to help you with that. And then people just don't think it through. Makes me angry. Um, and Tack, yeah, I'm telling you, you're right about that. Ryan sends in a a, a fifty three dollars or actually or fifty dollars. I think it was it's euros. You send in euros, but man, thank you, Ryan. I appreciate that. Ryan says, technical question: Why did the first three Star Trek movies see more seem more epic and grand? For instance, the bridge of ships felt more operational and busy. Whereas the later movies, particularly the Next Generation ones, felt like sets and too campy. Well, that's actually a good question. Now, here's the thing. Um, what you are seeing is uh, money. <laughs> the more money you have, the more you can do that. The more you, you have time to move the camera around. There's a lot of actual visual effects on the bridge. There's holograms and there's displays and... Uh, the more money you have, the more you can do with it. But also, it's it's a function. If you look at the bridge scenes and the the star, I, I assume you're talking about J.J. Abrams Star Trek movies. The cameras are always moving around. There's light everywhere. I don't understand like the lens flares. If you're on the bridge of a ship, it's like being in a recording studio. If you're in a recording studio, there's not lights blaring around all over the place. It, you're or you're in a mixing stage when you're mixing a movie. The lights dim so you can see the boards and where you're working. Uh, I watch those Star Trek movies and I'm like, I don't believe any of this, you know, because nobody would have lights like this in a control center. It should look more like a submarine. It should be darker or the bridge, the conning tower of a, of a naval vessel. But yeah, when you can, you have more money, you can put more people on the bridge, you can move the cameras around. Um, and when you do that, it seems more exciting. It's just actually a function of, and, and by the way, you know, those movies, I appreciate they have a look to them. I don't like all the lens flares and all that. I much prefer uh, a different kind of, of thing. But remember, um, when you're on the bridge, if you've ever been on the bridge of a naval ship, um, it's pretty, unless you're in a wartime situation, it's pretty, um, of course, I've never been on the bridge of a ship when it's in a wartime situation, but it's pretty contained. And the thing is, all you need to do is there's a difference. I'll tell you something. When you're making a movie, there's a difference between camera moves and what are called lock-off shots. And you can always make something seem more exciting when you're moving the camera. Because when you're moving the camera, for the viewer, it's all excitement. Now, if you look at the bridge scenes in J.J. In Abrams' Star Trek movies, the camera is always whipping around the bridge. And in a way, it's making up for... Um, um, it's tricking you into believing there's more going on than there really is. And you can create histrionics, but it's empty histrionics in my mind. But that's why. 
Um, and, and, you know, you are looking at sets. You're looking at spaceship sets. But the thing is, um, any set, if you're moving a camera around, it's going to be more exciting. And if you're going to have, if you can, if you can populate the bridge with more people coming and going, you're creating more visual excitement and it feels more full and exciting. Um, but you know what? Great science fiction doesn't require that. Great science fiction can tell a, a great story. I mean, if you look at some of the great Star Trek episodes, the classic Star Trek episodes, the the way a bridge, the bridge is lit, the darker lighting in the bridge. I mean, you look at something like the Corbomite Maneuver, or you look at the Doomsday Machine, or you look at Balance of Terror. It's pretty damn exciting. Great story, a, a great compelling story that is intellectually engaging is always better than flashy camera work. Always, I think. Uh, Michael Nemo says, I can guarantee you, you've already put more thought into this potential Trek film than Bad Robot has. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, look, I, uh, I, well, you know, I would encourage you to all listen to the Inglorious Trexperts podcast. We've done 10 episodes. We just recorded one that's a recap and, and we answer letters and people's comments and questions. But yeah, I mean, I've spent most of my life thinking about Star Trek. I'm surrounded. I have whole shelves of Star Trek books and things like that. I've certainly thought a lot about this. And, you know, professionally, I uh, worked on the Star Trek experience in Vegas while it was being made. I cut all the videos that you saw in, in the Star Trek experience. I made, I was, a, I was a paid Star Trek consultant for Viacom licensing in the mid-90s. Of course, I made Free Enterprise, the feature film that I wrote and directed, co-wrote, and I directed and edited the film starring William Shatner. Um, and then I worked on the Star Trek documentaries that you can now get in the Picard box set. So I've thought a lot about Star Trek in my life, for better or for worse. Uh, Twiggy McStumpwizzle. Twiggy McStumpwizzle says, what about Vic Mignogna and Star Trek Continues? Vic uh, ensured it was accurate to Star Trek look, lore, and writing. His 11 episodes concluded the five-year mission of the original series to Star Trek The Motion Picture. Listen, I... Um, so for those of you who don't know, there's a huge contingent of Star Trek fan films, of which I've peripherally been involved. Um, but Star Trek Continues and Star Trek New Voyages are probably the best of those Star Trek fan films. And Star Trek Continues uh, is an 11-episode fan film series that is beautifully made. It is, a, it is an incredible evocation of the original series. Other actors are playing um, the roles... Uh, James Dewins, who played Scotty, his son is plays the role of Scotty in, in Star Trek Continues. It's very authentic. Um, and I think Star Trek Continues is only as good as the writing. It was beautifully produced. Uh, Todd, is it Halbercorn, who plays Spock, I think is great. The acting, for the most part, is very, very good. They even went back and got people like Michael Forrest, who played Apollo, uh, to come back and play Apollo in uh, an episode of Star Trek Continues. I think Star Trek Continues is is a lot of it's quite good, and Vic Mignogna plays plays Kirk. Um, uh, I think it's hit and miss in terms of its writing. Um, I think Lorelai was that the like, second or third episode. I thought that was a pretty great episode when they leaned in and told original stories. And I will say this: I really liked the two part episode that fi fi the the episodes. 10 and 11 that ended the original series and led into the motion picture. Although I do think the scale of the Romulan bird of prey was off, but that's just me. Um, and it, it went back to where no man has gone before. Some of that stuff was really, really clever. Um, so yeah, I thought it was good. Sometimes it was great. Uh, Brandon Martin says, I'm in the awkward position of Star Trek 09 being my first movie. So I guess in terms of introducing new generations to Star Trek, it did its job. Absolutely. And here's the thing about, about as much as I might not like a lot of modern Star Trek, never, never forget there is a lot of people that are going to come to Star Trek for the very first time through Star Trek 09, through Into Darkness, through Star Trek Beyond, through Star Trek Discovery, through Strange New Worlds. I do not begrudge those people at all. And I think it's great that the Star Trek franchise has continued on and, and it continues to inspire new generations of, of people. And I think that's amazing. The problem that I have is, um, and I, I'll admit this, it is very difficult when you've watched a modern uh, produced Star Trek show 
And the same is true of Doctor Who. If you came to Doctor Who in, what, 2005 with Christopher Eccleston and you came up through the 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, is, is Gatwood the 15th Doctor? Because Tennant came back and was the 14th I don't remember. But so um, it's really hard to go back and watch like Patrick Troughton. It, it, and I understand that. And it's really difficult for modern audiences who came to Star Trek watching Discovery or Strange New Worlds to go back and watch the original series. Because it was made in 1966. At the time, it was very sophisticated. The special effects were very sophisticated. They were, they were doing green screen, optically printed, or optically composited effects. So I get that. I totally understand that. And, and that's true of, of, look at the James Bond franchise. If you grew up on the Daniel Craig Bond films and you try and go back and watch Dr. No, it's a little uh, lethargic. And um, it's, the pacing is different. It's, it's a whole different era, so I totally understand that. But, um, yeah. So I, I don't begrudge anybody that came to Star Trek in the modern day. I do think that great classic Star Trek if you go back and you watch some of these, there's a, there's a, there's a YouTuber. She's um, a friend of mine actually started sending me. It's weird because I, I feel like I shouldn't watch her because I'm a dirty old man. But there's um, she's pretty interesting, and her 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 YouTube channel is Bunny Tail Bunny Tails Reacts, and she started to go through the first season of the original series. She I don't know how old she is. To me, she looks like she's like. 18 or something. Maybe she's in her 20s. I don't know. But what I find interesting about her is she's watching the shows as they were meant to be seen. And she's been watching the episodes and giving commentary. And it's pretty interesting seeing classic Star Trek through her eyes. And I don't always agree with what she's saying, but she's giving it a fair shake. And that was something that I find reassuring. It gives me hope that a young person today can go back and watch the original series and get stuff out of it. And I think that her analysis is very cogent. And I think that um, um, she just did A Taste of Armageddon. And I thought that, I've always thought A Taste of Armageddon was a great meat and potatoes episode of Star Trek. It's not like classic, but it's it's why Star Trek sustains because it it was your it was your garden variety good episode of science fiction television and i really appreciated her take on the episode she's it's interesting i love going back and watching reaction videos to classic stuff from uh people today and that gives me hope it puts a smile on my face that still people are rediscovering star trek and if they can watch it with the right mindset like when i was a kid i knew for instance that universal horror those movies were going to be in black and white I, did, I wasn't prejudicial against them. I'm like, I'm not going to watch that because it's in black and white. I never thought that. And you would just train yourself. Nowadays, it's weird because as a film fan, when I was growing up, there were science fiction movies that were black and white. And most science fiction movies, when I was a kid, were older. You know, there wasn't a lot of modern, when I was a kid, contemporary science fiction that was being made. And when we would get something like Logan's Run, I loved it. You know, I would go, I, my mom, I was nine years old. My mom took me to the theater to see Logan's Run. Star Wars came out, changed my life. But before that, you know, from like War of the Worlds in 1953 all the way up to Logan's Run in 1976, I'd watch pretty much everything. And, and it, it wasn't like, it didn't jump light years beyond where it was at. Star Wars was such a monumental leap past science. All we had that was even remotely close, maybe Forbidden Planet 2001, in terms of space opera, whatever. I mean, yeah, I love Mario Bava's Planet of the Vampires and stuff. That was pretty cool, too. But Star Wars was was so far beyond, and then Alien, in terms of uh, space horror, um, cosmic horror. It was very Lovecraftian in its way. Total verisimilitude. There was nothing like those movies before, they, before we saw them. So, but never, never apologize. Um... John Suntress from the Word Balloon Podcast says, rest in peace, Tracy Torme. He worked for Next Generation, Sliders, Odyssey 5. He was Mel Torme's son. I had met Tracy on a number of occasions when I wrote for, I was the critic at large for Sci-Fi Universe Magazine back in the 90s. And we went to his house. Uh, we covered Sliders a great deal in the magazine. He was great. I love Tracy Torme. Um, I want to say Tracy Torme wrote The Big Goodbye, the first holodeck episode that won a Peabody Award. 
for Star Trek. And then he wrote, I think he wrote like the Royale. Um, but um, yeah. Um, so yeah, good stuff. Uh, Shea Marquell asks, and by the way, rest in peace, Tracy was way too young. He left us far too young. But he was a really great guy. Uh, Shea Marquell says, hey, Rob, any thoughts on Netflix's new sci-fi show, The Three-Body Problem, uh, run by Dan and Dave from Game of Thrones? I think the new trailer looks great. Well, uh, first of all, you know I'm a big fan of literary sci-fi, and The Three-Body Problem won the Hugo Award. It's a, it's a Chinese novel. Uh, season, I can never pronounce his name. But he also wrote The Wandering Earth. The Three-Body Problem is the first book in a trilogy called A Remembrance of Earth's Past. And I recommend everyone read it uh, because it's a first contact story that doesn't go very well for Earth, like, at all. But the first book is fascinating, and it looks terrific. Now, what's really interesting is the three-body problem has already been adapted as a 30-episode series in Chinese, and you can watch the all, they're subbed in English, you can watch the entire series in in uh on youtube at a uh, 10 cent it's one word 10 cent you can go to the 10 cent channel just go 10 cent three body problem and i would highly recommend watching it i thought the series was actually great it's you got to get used to the asian presentation of it all the way they use music is, is a little wacky and it is kind of lethargically paced but if you're used to watching a lot of asian cinema i highly recommend go go on youtube and start watching it. It is kind of the first 10 episodes can be a little rough to get through, but it's definitely worthwhile. And it's a really great adaptation of the book. And if you're a science fiction fan, pick up, you can get a, uh, the, the set with all three books in it. Um, so I highly recommend it. I think the show looks great. We'll see. I don't know how, I don't know if they're going to spend like three seasons telling the story of the first book. Because, so basically, I don't want to ruin it. You should just you should just read it because uh, just know that it has to do with um, um, humanity and the Trisolarans. Humanity meets the Trisolarans, and um, it goes from there. Um, Captain Robert April says Lower Decks does take the Star Trek universe very seriously. Mm, mm, it's gotten better, but I still think at the uh, look the, my problem with lower decks is it seems like it's a show about a bunch of people that have watched star trek again i don't believe they they have not made it its own thing it exists in a universe where star trek exists and everybody knows everything about these characters and the constant references it hasn't created its own hermetically sealed universe i just don't i don't um i don't believe it so um yeah um, but what can I do? What can I do? So that's just me. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, it's the Cerritos crew they make light of. Yeah, but they make light of everything. Um, I think, uh, Joe Panora says, why aren't they reaching out to Terry? Well, you know, movies and TV are different. Uh, I, I honestly, I don't know. I, I really, I do not know. Um, it's, it's, um, I, I think they should, you know, I think I, uh, what I liked about Picard season three so much is it felt like I was reading, it felt like a Star Trek movie that we hadn't seen before. It was a logical extension of where the characters were at. And, uh, I quite enjoyed it. I quite enjoyed it. Um, so, and I think, you know, the problem is, Terry has never worked in feature films. He's only worked in television. And there is a real, it's it's very odd. I mean, that line is still blurring. But the feature film world and the TV world are still, in terms of creators, are still very much people stay in TV and people stay in features. I mean, there's some crossover. But for the most part, it's still kind of, they're two different worlds, two different disciplines. So... That's, I think that's why. Um, uh, Mickey O says, I see you everywhere lately on my channels. You always serve as the voice of reason, except when it comes to Star Trek. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. I mean, you know, I only, I try and, uh, 
I try and maintain an even strain. I try and be a voice of reason. So I appreciate you saying so. I hope you like my appearances. I hope you're not ready to like turn me off like, fuck that guy. Uh, D's Webos says, why does search for Spock get so much hate? Um, again, I think search for Spock, there's a lot of great stuff in search for Spock. One search for Spock, I think it looks pretty cheap. The set design, when they get to the Genesis planet, there's, it, it, there's a lot of really, there's bad makeup in that movie. Uh, it's pretty stilted. Leonard Nimoy's direction is is one step above film school. And I don't mean to rip on it, but it was the first time he directed a movie. And it looks like it. And um, I think that's why there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of goofy stuff in... Like, that was the first time we'd seen... A, we, we saw Klingons in Star Trek The Motion Picture, but they, they, they felt... Uh, as much as I love Christopher Lloyd's Krug... I mean, he's very operatic. I mean, they've got a targ and, you know, feed him. And uh, it's just, it, there's a lot of goofy stuff in that. Whereas I really wish it would have felt more like Master and Commander. That said, there are some scenes in that movie that I really, really love. Such as when Sarek comes to Kirk's apartment and and has mind melds with him. I think there's 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 some great stuff in Star Trek 3. Um also ILM's effects work is great. And again, its effects work doesn't always match up with the live action stuff. So I think it's a very schizophrenic movie. And I think there's just a lot of really kind of mm, not smart things in it. So this year is its 40th anniversary. Maybe it will be reassessed. Uh, Garrett Groover says, Only three Kubrick movies need 4K releases to complete his f- filmography. Lolita, Barry Lyndon, and Eyes Wide Shut. Do you think we will get them this year? Well, we're getting Fear and Desire. Can you believe that? Um, but we also need, I don't think, is The Killing in 4K? Did Kino Lorber put out The Killing? And uh, is I guess Spartacus is in 4K. Uh, and then there's Killer's Kiss. Um, and But I, I would hope so. I mean, maybe. I'd love to get Lolita in 4K. I'm sure we probably will. Kino Lorber will probably, probably do that. But, um, yeah. Um, Calvin Bose, who's been talking to me about Star Trek for five years since I've done this channel. His son Braxton says, Braxton asked because he used to like Star Trek and... Wait, Braxton asked because he likes Star Trek and not Star Wars. Does that make him an intellectual? Um, probably. But, you know, I think the, here's the thing. Just because they both take place in space, I think Star Wars and Star Trek are very different things. I loved Star Wars. I've always loved Star Wars. Um, it changed my life. And But to me, I don't even... I don't even... It's weird that there's any kind of a rivalry because Star Wars, to me... You know, it's space fantasy. It's it's samurai movies. It's got a whole different... It's like watching Eastern martial arts films when I was a kid compared to, uh, well, to Star Trek. So I think they're you can like them both. Um, the Joe Cronin Show says, I used to find pre-1970s movies boring, but now I'm 39 and I've gone back and my God, those movies are amazing dialogue and stories. Well, it's true. I mean, the thing is we don't... You know, movies have changed. The biggest change in movies is how they're made in terms of, um, I mean, I hate to say it, and it's so cliche now, but MTV, the the fast cutting of the music video, you could tell a story in three minutes through cutting, and people understood what that, that story was. And that idea sort of permeated into how movies were made, and cinema changed. You know, at first, when you saw cinema, when it first began, it was very much, it was very like a, a stage play. You'd set up the camera, and while you had, you, you didn't see the proscenium of the of the stage, you did, it, it, was, it was more literary, and, and the language of cinema has evolved. M- moving the camera, for instance, as opposed to just shooting things, and then editorially, and cinema, cinematography, all of that has evolved. But when you go back and you watch, I mean, like you said, 
when I watch movies of the 70s, like, for instance, John Frankenheimer's entire output of the 1960s, you know, Birdman of Alcatraz, Seconds, which is one of my favorite science fiction movies of all time, Seven Days in May, The Train, The Manchurian Candidate. Those movies feel like they were made for adults. You know, you watch those movies. The way, watch, watch a movie like uh, The Sweet Smell of Success. I mean, my God. Uh, and these movies were made for adults. One of my favorite movies of all time is All About Eve, Best Picture winner of 1950. Now it's considered a camp classic, but it's a great movie about the theater and it has one of my favorite uh, female villains in all of cinema history. You go back and you watch these movies, it's like they're written for adults. We we have been getting, because of the way that the studio storytelling has evolved, the the movies look a lot better. But I think that the writing, just society has changed. We've become much more infantilized. The adult world was more of the adult world than we have been, especially here in America. It's almost like when you're 40 years old, you're still 20. Not that I would know that. <laughs> but old movies... Um, um, Tom Jr. Jackson says, Rob, you missed Word Balloon's first five-buck observation. I did? Um, maybe. I, I haven't gone through everything yet. It's... Um, um, there's a lot of, um, uh, things I'm still trying to get through. So, um, let me see if I did. Um, oh yeah. Um, uh, well, Scott Bartholomew says, I will always be a Trek originalist, not interested in these non-canon mutations. Um, well, you know, it's it's but it's interesting. It's interesting to see how what I loved about classic Star Trek is the f like I don't consider the cage. So for people who don't know, most people I'm sure know, but Star Trek where Captain Pike came from, they made in 1965 the first Star Trek. They made a pilot for the cage where Jeffrey Hunter played Captain Pike and there was Dr. Boyce and uh, uh, Leonard Nimoy played Spock and that was famously rejected by the network. And then they made a second pilot, which was kind of unheard of at the time, that starred William Shatner as Captain Kirk. But smartly, what they did was they took that unused pilot and they incorporated it into the only two-part episode of the original series, which was the Menagerie Part 1 and 2. And what was interesting, so within Star Trek, by using that rejected pilot, they created Star Trek continuity, where they showed the first pilot had the uniforms were a little different, the sets were a little different, the Enterprise was the model wasn't as refined. So it showed evolution within the Star Trek universe. And for fandom, that was like awesome. What you're seeing are images from 11 years ago. That means in the first season of Star Trek, you saw the Enterprise, you saw 11 years of its history and the characters as well, which was amazing. So for a show to have done that, it immediately created Star Trek continuity. And so then you assume you have the five-year mission. By the time you get to the next, I mean, um, Star Trek The Motion Picture, Star Trek The Motion Picture takes place, Kirk was was uh, two and a half years, he was head of Starfleet operations. So we only saw the first three, the first three seasons, so we only saw three years of the Enterprise's um, five-year mission. You could say that the animated series, if you want to consider that canonical, the animated series was... Um, the other two, the other two years. So, if you consider that plus eleven years of the Enterprise's history, so you're looking at fourteen years, and then you give Kirk two and a half years as head of Starfleet operations. You're now at sixteen. So you've seen sixteen and a half years of the Star Trek universe by the time you get to Star Trek: The Motion Picture, which is pretty fascinating. And then after that, you assume it's generally considered that there was another five-year mission after the motion picture. And then by the time you get to Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, he says, I, as a man I haven't seen in 15 years, is trying to kill me. So you're now 15 years away from the first season of Star Trek, which was 11 years away from the cage. So what was really cool about Star Trek within the first, uh, from 1966 to 1982 you saw a lot, there, there's a whole history there that, that you can extrapolate what was what was there. But So Star Trek was always moving forward. Then the next generation was like 80 years after that. What I don't understand is, 
they've already teed up this universe. So from 1966 to 2005, the Star Trek universe is pretty expansive. And if you want to go back to certain times when they went back into the past, like in First Contact or whatever, you have hundreds of years of Star Trek documented. So it never occurred to me, like Star Trek Discovery, with all of its technology and the fact nothing looked, if Star Trek Discovery was set in the 25th century, I mean, I still would think that, you know, Michael Burnham is not a very well-written character, but I could have bought into the reality of it because it's so far in advance of Star Trek. It would have slotted right in. and and But they decided to make it, I mean, I know that's how Brian Fuller originally wanted to make it, but it just, the way after Brian Fuller left and, the, and Kurtzman took over and they morphed the technology, you know, the tardigrade character that you saw in the first season was actually a member of the crew. Efrain was his name. And the whole thing about the micellular network, they were using that for terraforming. So the, 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 the changes they made in the first season of Discovery were really kind of weird. And I think it threw the whole show off because people made crazy decisions. Um, but yeah. Um, so John Suntra says, I think Star Trek IV's success makes the current idiots think it's okay to parody Trek given the 80s Earth reaction to the TOS cast. Same with the USS Callister. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Nobody takes the original series. It's it's very difficult for people. And because pop culture, Star Trek has permeated pop culture all the way back to the John Belushi Saturday Night Live sketches. And so Star Trek has become this thing that it's almost... A lot of people know the Star Trek parodies more than they know Star Trek itself. And I think that's definitely problematic when you're going back and looking at Star Trek. Um, uh, Jay Bling says, I enjoyed Star Trek 09 at first, but now the only good thing about it is the music featured in the primary trailer, Freedom Fighters by Two Steps from Hell. That's a great piece of music. Um, Scott, it's true. It was a great piece of music. Scott Bartholomew says, Scat Trek, 2009 to the present, minus Picard season three, will always be a DEI juvenile shit show. They need to do a hard sci-fi iteration of Trek. Uh, I agree. I would love to see, I mean, if you leaned into, Star Trek should be more like The Expanse than, I mean, modern Star Trek should should be that way. It, it feels, it does feel juvenile because none of the characters act like real people. They're not written as real people. They're written as Star Trek people, like the pop culture sense memory of what Star Trek characters should be. And I hate that. Um, I hate that. I really do not like that at all. Um, so, it's a bummer. Uh, where was I? Um, Joe Cronin. Oh, I, that, that was about the 1979 movies. Uh, Darren L M L uh, M N. Was that for, Darren L from Minnesota? Maybe we need Herman uh, Herman's Head reboot. More Yeardley. <laughs> Haven't we seen enough of her on The Simpsons? <laughs> Boy, that's uh, that's pretty funny. Um, that's um, yeah. You don't you don't hear you don't hear a lot about that. Our friend Julian Mushkin. Uh, so odd. Julian says. So odd, this black and white bias. Hell, when I was young, all we had was a black and white TV. I only saw color TV at my grandparents' place. Also saw someone on Reddit ran into Mrs. Carey from Se- or uh, Mrs. Casey from Severance. She said they would be done filming the second season in a few months. Wow, oh, that's interesting. Um, yeah, you know, I, I don't understand this bias to not watch anything old. Why would you not want... It's so weird. But you know... Um, when we were younger, when I was a kid, I was a lot closer to, I mean, even in the sixties, there were still lots of black and white movies made a lot of, a lot of the science fiction television. I watched like twilight zone. I can't imagine growing up, not watching the original twilight zone because it was in black and white. It's one of the greatest things that's ever been on television. So to not, um, to not watch the twilight zone, that would have been, yeah, that's just that, that's, um, can't imagine I can't imagine what that would be like so I think you're I think you're right about that Julian um yeah well on that note I think I'm gonna bring an end to this uh this chat it's been fun 
Um, I, I'm, I'm sure I bitched and moaned enough to piss people off. But here's the thing. As always, I want to see great characters and great stories. I want to see great science fiction. And what I don't understand is, I mean, I'm, I'm surrounded by, I don't know how many books I have left. There's, I would say there's a couple thousand books in here. I mean, what, what really bothers me is that science fiction, great science fiction, we're surrounded by it. And we're seeing it on, on TV. I mean, I think the great thing about For All Mankind is it's both a melodrama and it's, it's interesting sci-fi. I mean, season two of, of uh, Foundation, we're getting the three-body problem. And the more uh, this kind of science fiction that we're getting, Star Trek should be the Tiffany standard. You know, it should be, I should be getting a powder blue box with a white ribbon on top of it every episode of Star Trek. But I don't think anybody who's working on Star Trek knows how to do that or even what kind of stories that they should be looking towards to tell. I, I think that one of the things that, that, to me, metaphorically is telling is what they've done to the Gorn on Strange New Worlds. So the Gorn, as depicted in the first season original series episode, Arena, for those of you who don't know, the lizard monster wearing the gold lame or whatever, Uzz. Uh, that Kirk fights in kind of slow motion, that has come to signify, I think, in in a lot of people's minds, what classic Star Trek is. You know, when the Gorn's taking shots at Kirk and he's doing his flying kicks. I mean, people are, are that's what they think of. So you can't help, and I understand this, I understand this mindset. You can't help but think about that. But I would I would ask this. If you have never seen Arena, that episode, I'm sure a lot of people may be watching this have never seen it, give it a whirl. Because if all you've ever seen is depictions of Kirk fighting the Gorn in pop culture and seen him sitting on a couch playing video games with the Gorn, the opening half hour of that episode is some of the most riveting science fiction television you'll, you'll see. From the opening when they beam down to Cestus Three, you'll be amazed at the location work they do. And then the chasing and what's going on and everything that happens. It's an incredibly serious episode of Star Trek that has a surprising conclusion. And to me, Arena represented some of the greatest of Star Trek. Now it's a joke. And I get it. And I think that what's happened is they took... In the, in the minds of the people that are working on Strange New Worlds, Akiva Goldsman, even he, I went to conventions when I was in the 70s or whatever, Akiva Goldsman looked at the Gorn and he goes, you know, let's take this crazy, silly monster and make him, let's make him all cool. Let's make him xenomorphs and alien. That's the problem. In Star Trek, they're like, let's make them this from this thing. They don't try and come up with their own original ideas. The thing about Star Trek is it had a lot of horror in it. A lot of, and there's been elements of it, I mean, in Discovery, they tried to sort of incorporate some Lovecraftian elements into their aliens and all that, which I appreciated. I'm not going to, I'm not, it just wasn't done well. It wasn't well thought out. Nobody sat down and said, okay, if A and B and C and D are, are, are true, then E, F, G, H, I, J, K, they have to be true as well. And that always, they, they, they didn't really do that. And that's, that's my problem is having read so many classic science fiction novels the world building in modern Star Trek is is god awful, especially in the um, the the future, the Discovery future, a thousand years from now. Oh, and I, I I'm just like my God, please read a science fiction novel. I'll give you five. Just I guarantee you, there, there's better ideas. And sometimes they did. They ripped off uh, those who walk away from Umlas, the Ursula K. Le Guin story, uh, in the first season of Strange New Worlds, which I was shocked by because they're going around going yes we were heavily inspired by Ursula K. Le Guin why didn't you give her story credit they went on the original Star Trek but you've heard me say this a million times before and I don't know if anyone wants me to say it again um, I'm still laughing about the Herman's Head reboot but that's what I want great stories well told give me great stories and we're getting some great literary science fiction I mean the three body problem I guarantee you I mean I would like Star Trek to evolve into telling those kinds of stories Real hard sci-fi stories that are compelling, that have something to say. I mean, Strange New Worlds is the pop culture memory remake of Star Trek. 
It has no credibility. I don't believe any of it. I don't believe how big the sets are. I don't believe cr- there's no military decorum in that show at all. You know, everyone's like friends with everybody else. What's up, man? How you doing? Come to my cabin. I'll cook for you. Okay, man. The Gorn are just monsters. I mean, I don't understand how the Gorn became a spacefaring race from going with the life cycle they show us, the xenomorph lifestyle, the lifestyle, the life cycle they just ripped off from Alien. Anyway, on that note, I'm going to end this show. I want to thank Tom Jr. Jackson for being a moderator. I want to thank all of you for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, smash that like button if you want to. If you think I'm a total douche, don't. Or even if you think I'm a douche, maybe I'll I'll be your uh, uh, your douche canoe that you like to get away. With. You, you watch the show just to remind yourself how much better you are than I am, because that's true too. I mean, I am that old man shouting at clouds. Maybe I have to accept that that's that's my lot in life. But anyway, um, yes. But thank you all for being here. I appreciate that. And again, like, subscribe, tell your friends, and um, I'll be back. You know what? I won't be back to tomorrow. Here's a flex. I'm going to the For All Mankind crew, uh, the big uh, For All Mankind screening tomorrow to watch the final episode of the fourth season in a movie theater with some of the cast and the creators of the show. So there you go. And on that note, oh, um, um, Darth (laughs) Plato just sends in a, a tips. Well, thanks, man. Appreciate that. Um, or he's saying that I'm looking at tips. I don't think, uh, did I miss a tip? Did I miss someone's tip? I will look. I got Julian Mushkin's tip. Didn't miss that. Um, oh, unless somebody sent something in. Sometimes they don't show up. But I'll look again. If Darth Plato, let's see what you, if if I missed a tip all. Julian. Uh, a, a tuck, tack. Uh, I don't see any others. I don't think I missed any. Not on the show. Unless you sent one in. I don't see it. Um, yeah, I think I got everybody. As I'm looking. Unless something just popped up. No, I don't see it. So I'm going to end this show. And if I missed it, I'll get you back on the next show. And anyone, everyone, I want to thank you all for supporting this channel via Super Chats and tips. And memberships. We have great member calls. Um, we don't have a member call this week. We'll have one in the following week. And those member calls are great. They last a long time, and they're lots of fun. Um, And as far as designing Hollywood goes, I have an interview, not with a costume designer. I'll say this. I have an interview with a cinematographer uh, on this Saturday in the morning. I am very, very excited to bring you this um, interview. And this cinematographer has shot movies, movies that you've seen and love, and movies that you're eagerly waiting for. And that's the only hint I can give you. Uh, but so look out for that. And on that note, remember, every person you meet has a story to tell that you have yet to hear. And all you have to do is listen. And with that, have a better night.